The idea behind the show is simply asking guests what they would tell a stranger on a plane if they were sitting next to them and the stranger asked them for advice. The scenery is passing very fast, but the seer is constant. The one who's seeing is the same. Let me appreciate you for asking a question that I haven't been asked after 2,500 or so uh, interviews over the years. Uh, you have to drop the EGO, which is everyone's greatest obstacle. In 2008, Grant and I had been married for four years. I was pregnant with my first child. Um, we were, the economy was collapsing and we were on the verge of losing everything financially. So welcome everybody. It's so exciting to be here with another edition of our show. I'm super stoked and excited to have a first time guest, somebody I haven't had the opportunity to interview just yet, but I'm going to now, uh, which I'm super excited about. So uh, Christina Mand, and I'm going to see if I pronounce this right, Luckyani. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you. I did some practice beforehand. Uh, so I'm so excited to be here with you today. And I want to dive into the new book you're working on. I want to dive in a little bit to the Mind Valley world as well. But I have a couple of questions I like to ask every guest I interview. I've asked one of these questions over 6,000 times. So I still am excited about this question. I don't know why, but I call it the time machine question. It's almost like it sounds like. And basically, the question is this if you could jump into a time machine, Go back and talk to, to a younger Christina and give her some life advice based on what you've learned in the years since. What do you think you might tell younger Christina? Well, first of all, thank you, Corey, for having me. It's a pleasure. And I'm, I'm glad that you're excited because ex excitement kind of, um, you know, it spills over. So I feel more excited now. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the time machine, um, you know, if uh, if that time machine would move me back to that time in my current age, then I guess uh, it would be just an interesting experience to be there, but I wouldn't give myself any advice. If it also regressed my age <laughs> and kept my own wisdom back, I would probably do all the silly things I haven't uh, done in a long time because I'm not I'm not 18-year-old, uh, I'm not 25-year-old anymore, so I would definitely uh, party uh, in, until the morning, wear something silly and, and, and be silly. But I wouldn't give myself an advice for one simple reason. Um, if I were to give myself advice and even um, maybe convince uh, the younger version of me not to do certain mistakes, I would deprive myself of an experience which have made me what I am right now. And I'm not sure if I would want to take the risk of uh, ending up having a completely different person on hand right now at this point. So I'd rather not, uh, not do uh, something which... Um, which is such an integral part of my, you know, I, I am what I am, thanks to all the stupid things I did when I was younger. So I love that. And I'll say I'm about 50, 50, 50% 50 of the people I ask that question say, a, some form of they wouldn't even get in the time machine if they had the opportunity. They might get in the time machine if they could go somewhere else and it wouldn't affect anything. But they, most of the people I talked to in that 50% wouldn't go back and tell their younger self anything. They'd actually, a lot of them have said they'd be scared to even go interact with the younger self in case the butterfly effect changed anything. So it is kind of intriguing how when we're younger, we want to change everything about our life. And then as we get older and gain some wisdom and life experience, most of us, if we're happy where we're at, would never change a thing. And that's even what some of them say they would tell their younger self is just don't change anything. I just want to give you a high five. Keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right track. So so your answer definitely echoes what I have heard in the past, which I love. Uh, and it's interesting sometimes to hear that some people will go back and talk to the younger self and, and don't care if it would change something. So I love the different answers to that question. Uh, second question I said I ask everybody is very similar, but you'll probably see quickly the difference between the two. Uh, it's <laughs> I call it the passenger question. And basically it's this, if you could, uh, if you were sitting next to a passenger on a plane, a stranger, they leaned over and asked you from life, for life advice. Now this isn't advice you'd give to younger Christina. So this, this one you could probably give and you wouldn't have to worry about affecting your life. But if you could give advice to a stranger on a plane that needed some advice, what do you think you might tell the stranger on a plane? Uh, I think it depends on whether the stranger would have asked me for advice. If the stranger just shared their life story, I, it's not very likely I would uh, I, I would uh, give advice. I, sometimes I, I don't say that I'm uh, such a nice person as never to advise anything to anyone, but uh, I usually would do that to the people that I really love and who are very close to me. Uh, but strangers, it's not very likely I would uh, advise anything. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, there is this idea that the moment you give advice, you take responsibility for that person's future in some little way. Uh, but that's probably not what bothers me. I, I just don't think that... Um, 
that advice should be given if it's not asked, unless it's someone who is in your care. And uh, if it's asked, uh, there is always an option that the person doesn't uh, take your advice or doesn't listen to you or doesn't believe you. And um, yeah, I, I have very uh, chill relationship with advice. Mm. I, I, well, I love that you're honest about that. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I love the fact that you've made, maybe it sounds like you've made peace with that and, you know, and have found a way to make that your superpower. So I love that. Um, so I want to shift over to talk about your book and first and foremost, I love the title. So, uh, we always hear people talking about owning, owning a word, like a owning a name that's different uh, and owning that so that when people search that you're the only one that comes up. Uh, I want I want to talk about the title is but I want to ask you was that was that part of it was that intentional with the name that you chose? You know, I would uh, I would have loved it to be my creation but the word flawsome existed uh before I stumbled upon it. I do not know how long it has existed. It's it's a, a word that uh, nobody has claimed. Uh, it is somewhere out in the internet and I have claimed it for my book. Uh, I don't think it's fair to, um, I don't think it's fair to actually, um, uh, you know, get, get the property rights on, on something so generic <laughs> as the word. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's I, I just stumbled upon it. And I think it came into my life when I needed it, because I was writing a book, and I had a whole lot of ideas, how to call it. But then when the book was ready, it was so clear that it was becoming flawsome and nothing else. Well, let me ask you this. And and when I ask that too, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes um, we can kind of own the name in the minds of other people. And of course, it doesn't mean intellectually we own it, but we're the person that they think of when they think of that name. And I feel like that's going to happen for you with this name. <laughs> but let me, okay, and when I Googled it, by the way, you're like, you came up right away. So you're <laughs> yeah. already starting to own this word. But um, what does it mean to you? Like, what does Flossom mean to you? I mean, I know what it means to me. I did a little bit of research of what it kind of technically means, but I'm curious what it means to you. You know, you actually hit the nail on the head. I believe that flossum, everybody has to come up with their own definition of flossum. Uh, in my definition, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's when you uh, don't let your, your flaws be, uh, you know, your curse, when you, you can still be awesome uh, with your flaws. But of course, in my book, I go further and deeper than that, because the idea that you just own your flaws and you're just so, you know, lovable, no matter what you are, it's not new. It's not new at all. And I would actually uh, like um, people to uh, look a little deeper. Uh, so what, what I'm driving at in my book is that it is usually those flaws that we are most ashamed of, not the easy ones, which is so easy to throw around, you know, I'm, I'm working too much, or I'm a perfectionist. These are, these are the easy flaws. Nobody, nobody's going to look at you and say like, shame on you. Uh, but the ones which you don't dare to share, uh, the ones which make you blush or cringe or maybe shrink and feel uh, not worthy. I think that when you have the courage to uh, own those things, to look them in the eye and admit that they are part of your story and they have made you what you are, and then you have a chance to actually discover that your biggest strength and your biggest value for the world may lie in those very shameful qualities about you. Wow. And so with the book itself, if, if somebody were to pick up the book uh, today and, you know, they said to you, oh, my God, Christina, I love the book. Here's what I took from it. What would you love that the here's what I took from it to be like? What, what would you like a person to walk away from the book and say, this book did this for me? I think it's so um you know, it's such a journey that it's going to be different for other, other people. So my first editor, uh, I love when people love my book. And uh, with that, I uh, I, ex uh, I expect that there will be people who will hate it, which I think is fine as well. Uh, but uh, my first editor, uh, she loved my book. And she, at some point, she said, I'm going to uh, highlight some, some of the ideas which I loved. And I think they should go into your social media when you start launching the book. She had like two pages of quotes. So, <laughs> you know, and there are a lot of things, there are really a lot of things. Uh, and I, I really, um, what I think I would, uh, would make me happy is uh, if uh, the readers who, who picked the book, if they had paradigm shifted in just even one thing, anything at all. And that would be, that would be an accomplishment for me in the sense that uh, it's book, the, the book has served its purpose. Uh, which one? I think you you see, um, 
I do hope there will be a lot of people who will be reading it, but every single person has their own journey and they have their, their questions and their struggles. So that paradigm shift or that um, realization uh, has to be relevant to that uh, particular person. That's why I don't want to pinpoint one particular thing. Maybe if you're asking it as a marketing question, <laughs> then my answer would be, I would like people to find the way back to themselves real. <laughs> Well, and, and, and I, 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 I love that um, in terms of, you know, the fact that you, well, I, I love the fact that you're not trying to put, um, what would say, uh, any kind of demands out into the world of this is what you have to do this. Like, I noticed that that's something that really rings true with what you're saying is you want it to be, and I'm just talking, talking the book, it sounds like a general, you want people to be who they are and to meet them where they're at versus saying, you know, this is what. I'm directing you in this direction. It's more like, let's figure out what you need, who you are, and you'll ultimately come to that by yourself. And I'm just going to be a guide. That's kind of what I'm hearing. And that's so true, because guess what? My book is about authenticity, right? <laughs> about people finding their way back to themselves. And who am I to tell them what it means to be you? Um, I, I, I couldn't know. I think as many people as there are on, in, on this planet Earth, as as many destinations that book is going to have. So now with if we shifted to Mind Valley for a minute. So you're co-founder co-founder of Mind Valley. Um obviously most of the people listening to this I think would be very familiar with with the company and with what you guys do, but um whether they are or not, I guess I'll ask this question. Um will this become or is this a but well, I'll say is this a, or will this become a course inside of Mind Valley as well? Uh, yes, it is, of course, uh, because uh, that's how uh, <laughs> that's how it works. Uh, I'm uh, I'm doing pre-sales of my book, and because the launch is still uh, a while uh, ahead, uh, of course, we have to give something along with the book. And I uh, recorded two programs to go with the book. They are not. Um, they're connected to the book in terms of theme uh, and and topics that we discuss, but they're not uh, they're not like a replica of the book by no means. So uh, yes, there are Mind Valley courses, uh, but they haven't been launched yet. <laughs> Nice. Well, and, and then I don't feel bad for asking the question because because I, I am a member. And I feel bad if I was asking the question and it was sitting there on the top <laughs> of the website and I hadn't seen it because I've been so busy. Um, so let me ask you this then as well on the Mind Valley side before we shift back to the book. But uh, Mind Valley, and I said, you know, a lot of the people listening will know what Mind Valley is. But just quickly for those that when I say the word, if they're not familiar, how would you describe Mind Valley? I think Mind Valley is one of the biggest uh, educational platforms in the world, which which teaches uh, things which are important for life. You know how to live extraordinary, happy, fulfilled, meaningful lives, and we cover the whole multitude of topics which um, are not covered by well by the regular academic education. So it's a school of life. Mm, I love that the school of life. That's a great great summary. And so shifting back. Up. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm super familiar. So I definitely saw that right away. But I'm glad you pointed it out because, again, somebody who maybe is starting to learn what Mind Valley is, uh, they'll recognize that logo right when they go to the website. And in fact, if you wouldn't have said it, they'll probably go, "Where have I seen that before?" <laughs> They're watching this interview and find their way to the website. So to shift back to the book as we start to wind down, um, in terms of the book itself, you mentioned that you're launching. Uh, you know, I guess the the book you, you said you're launching in advance. So timeline of course it depends when they're listening to this uh but when is there an exact day right now i think i know the answer to this but is there an exact day when people will be jumping into the store to buy the book and all that kind of good stuff so you you uh, the the launch day is june and that's when the book is going to be on the bookshelves in the bookstores and that's what uh, what a book launch day is but of course because uh, i'm uh, restless i i'm going to uh, give an opportunity for people to pre-buy the book or pre-order the book uh, and uh, essentially they buy a book they get one of the mind valley new courses on self-love it's called 10 questions for self-love while they're waiting for the book to be shipped to them Wow. And then so uh, in terms of that, uh, just one last thing on that side. And then I want to ask you, of course, uh, how people can find the book, because I'm sure now, uh, even if it's not available for pre-order or depending when they're listening to this again, what stage it's at, I'm sure you have it the website where people can go to learn fully about it. Uh, but one other question about the book itself, in terms of the book, 
what is your reason or catalyst for wanting to even put this stuff into a book? I mean, you're part of Mind Valley, so of course you could put it in there, you could put it as a video, you could do a whole bunch of things. What is the reason for a book for you? Like, are you a book lover or what's the book connection? Uh, well, I am a book lover, obviously. Maybe you can see by the background, which is actually a real background. <laughs> I was wondering that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, I am a writer as well. And I've, I think I've always been a writer, but I've never owned uh, that part of me. I've always enjoyed writing. I enjoyed literature. So for me, the book is the ultimate form of self-expression. Of course, I've uh, created courses with Mind Valley. I've spoken of Sage. I've taught people life. Uh, so this was uh, a combination of my teachings, which is uh, which, which is my profession. Uh, with with my passion, which is writing. I do write much better than I speak. So <laughs> uh, it, it had to happen. I knew, I always knew it would happen, but uh, it happened when it uh, when I was ready for that, when my message was ready. So last official question, then again, I just want to ask where people can get the book, all that kind of good stuff. But the last official question is, I love to ask people this question because I love the different answers you get, but what would you say is the one thing that most people, might not be everybody, but most people don't know about you. About me? Yeah. Don't most you? people don't know that now I'm a hobby farmer. That's my new new thing. <laughs> but that's uh, that's not because I keep it secret, because it's absolutely new. Um, uh, I do not know. There are there are a lot of things that people don't know about me. Obviously, most people. Uh, my deepest, darkest uh, fears, I have them. <laughs> a lot of people are surprised that I love actually classical literature over, <laughs> over the literature in my own industry. <laughs> um, that, that's a fair assessment. I'm quite a snob when it comes to art and music and this kind of things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there there are a lot of things people don't know about me because my life is so full of different aspects, and usually we know people in one uh, in one of the facets that they show to the world. Like if you know me professionally, you would know my professional side. If you know me as a mom in school, you would know me from that angle. So different people know me in different ways. But uh, let's say in Mind Valley, there are so many things to discover. I love that, and I'll ask you. Then I just picked up this book yesterday. I don't know if you can see it here. The Prophet. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think I've ever read that, but when you say about th those type of books, like that's a like a classic literature book that I picked up yesterday and I'd never heard of it. And then I started reading about it and it's considered like a masterpiece. So uh, if you haven't checked that out, The Prophet uh, by Calhill Gibran. So yeah, yeah, of course, I've uh, I actually I would actually like to read that. Uh, I haven't. My uh, another very interesting quirk is that I like to read books uh, when they're in my hands. So I was waiting. I, I always wanted to read Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search of Meaning, but I couldn't find it. Uh, and, and Amazon didn't ship to where I lived. So it took me a few years until I read it only because I have to have a book in my hands. That's a little quirk about me. <laughs> Well, you know what? Obviously, I just showed you a printed book. Um, that's my quirk too. I have never yet in my life, hate admitting this, I've never read a digital book yet in my life. A Kindle book, I've never been able to finish one. So I'm a book in my hand and I have Victor Frankl's book somewhere here too. I love it. It's a classic. So yeah. Christina, this has been an absolute pleasure. Last quick thing, of course, is for those that want to grab the book, where would you send them? Uh, and is there any last thing you want to share about the book for those that may be wanting to jump on and grab a copy themselves? Of course, I would like people to buy a book from my website because uh, that's where I give the bonus and the gifts and all things like that. And that's christinamand.com slash book. And Christina Mand, I have an Estonian name, Christina with a K, M-A-N-D. Uh, of course, Mind Valley will be selling the book as well. And it will be on the shelves of uh, Barnes and Nobles, I believe, and, and some other big shops in in US. So, And maybe even in the airport. That would be fun. <laughs> That would be awesome and really fun. And I expect I'm going to open up the New York Times at some point and see it near the top of that or on the top of that list. So I can't wait until that, 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 that actually actualizes itself. So thank you so much, Christina. As I said, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'll call it a to be continued with your permission and just say till next time. But thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was really enjoyable conversation.